Okay, welcome everyone. It's five o'clock, so we'll get started. I, we might expect a couple more people to join us in the next few minutes. Um, a big welcome to Brian, who is our speaker today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brandon. I'm a final year PhD student here in the department. Um, and we are about to embark on yet another one of our uh, Wednesday seminar presentations. Uh, the Wednesday seminars are a space where academic staff and uh, PhD students and undergraduates and others from the public can gather together to learn about the exciting archaeology that's going on in our department and for their fields. Because of the success of the last semester's Wednesday seminar series, we're really highlighting a lot of speakers from within our own department. Um, and our speaker today is no exception to that. Just a quick reminder to everyone here that the presentation is recorded. Um, and also, all of us, um, as is tradition, will go to, or at least are welcome to go to the Marquis Wellington um, after presentation for a couple of points. And perhaps we can um, add a few extra questions to our speaker then. Um, so our speaker today is Dr. Brian Costello. He's a teaching fellow in archaeology here uh, with an interest in medieval and funerary archaeology. Um, he has a couple of papers that are in the process. Um, the results of his PhD, so he has a, a big outburst of research output um, just to come. We're really excited to uh, be witnesses to the presentation form of that today. Um, so without further ado, please welcome Dr. Costello. Thank you, Brandon. Appreciate that. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming. Appreciate this. So revisiting the heirloom factor. This is going to be talking about object curation, specifically heirlooms. Uh, the identification and interpretation, and then the interpretation of the remembrance at funerals during the early medieval period. So specifically, when I started this, of course, this is the accumulation of my PhD and subsequent research and up to date. And it was trying to fill a gap in knowledge. Throughout, it was finding a lot of uh, specifically graves that were out of the chronological context of that grave. Never really was fully investigated, mostly because Problems in chronologies in general and typologies stop that from happening and a little bit of others, but it was just kind of summarized and a bit vague throughout. So this research kind of helps identify that and actually highlights a lot of new stuff about early medieval mortuary archaeology in general. So today this will look over the identification and interpretation of curated objects. Objects. Anglo-Saxon burials. burials. Just a quick that reminder that, that if you're joining us online to keep your microphones muted, please. Oh, hold on. People aren't seeing slides. Oh, was it not sharing? Oh, there, okay, we go. Not. there we go. Try that again. Perfect. Okay. No problem. I come with cake. Folks. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> the cake has arrived. Excellent. So, of course, the identification and interpretation of heirlooms within early Anglo-Saxon burials. This is looking at from graves from Kent, Kentish cemeteries from the 5th to 7th century AD. Uh, it also interpreted their effect on social remembrance and specifically social competition during the funeral. And also this added a little reassessment of interpreting early medieval burials in general as well. So just a quick overview of this period. It is the 5th to 7th centuries AD, also known as the migration period and a few other names. It's also known as a proto-historic period, which had a very little or few written records, lack thereof. Um, from the analysis of po grave cemetery populations, small communities of usually less than 100 people. Uh, it is really well known from its furnished burials, both inhumations and cremations, well, which where the majority of material culture comes from in this period is the cemeteries themselves. Uh, throughout, there was large cemeteries with, that were used by multiple communities, multiple groups of people, and a lot of smaller satellite cemeteries at the peripheries. And this was a period of social stratification and political competition leading up to the formation of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms beginning in the 7th century. So the grave furnishings generally display a gendered burial throughout. Generally, not always, but generally. For the male gendered burial, there's a lot of weapons, assemblage objects, shields, spears, axes, and sometimes swords. Uh, for the female gendered burials, we have dress accessories, necklaces, brooches specifically, and things of that nature. And objects generally displayed are equated to the stage of life cycle people are at. 
So shields weren't really given until a male gendered burial was at least 16 years of age. They were average and older. Swords weren't given to people unless they were adults. Uh, certain types of brooches were given to certain age levels as well. And children were generally either unfurnished or had very few or little grave goods across early Anglo-Saxon England. So these cemeteries displayed an inequality of grave goods as well. Some graves have a lot more wealth or objects within. Some graves have little or none. And this has been sort of interpreted as individuality first, as well as social competition between families and kin groups. The furnishing of graves diminishes throughout the 7th century, with the exception of elaborate princely burials like at Sutton Hoo, where we have almost like familial plots of mound burials and elaborate ones or singular burials that are out by themselves. And also, a lot of these cemeteries are reusing the landscape and also reusing older material. Approximately one third of all early Anglo-Saxon cemeteries reuse prehistoric monuments, other things in the landscape, specifically Bronze Age barrows is one of the more popular one. And also, there's been a lot of research on the reuse of Roman objects, uh, specifically within early Anglo-Saxon graves. This has been more interpreted for scavenging rather than curating as well, uh, and it has been a big discussion early in this research. It did roll, did. Anglo-Saxons actually curate Roman objects, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. This gets into this actually, the distant past versus the recent past. Things like the reuse of prehistoric monuments, reuse of earlier Roman objects, that's more of the distant past living outside of living memory, relics, antiques. They're forming legends and myths for these people, whereas the recent past within the living memory was history's places and objects of themselves, and this is where heirlooms sort of fall into. So just to conclude on this part, funerals were an emotive time of gathering and remembrance. Burials were a platform to remember and create an idealized identity, whether it was their actual identity or not, uh, of the deceased portrayed through the funeral and the placement of objects. Objects were utilized as technologies of remembrance. They were mnemonic devices to affect the social remembrance of those gathered at the funeral. And all of these objects, a lot of them displayed wealth and status, they would be visible to the mourners prior to the backfilling of the grave and has been previously acknowledged that specifically socially important objects would have been recognizable to those present, just like biographical objects or heirlooms. So what makes an heirloom? What is an heirloom? This little gold boxing glove right here actually was my great grandfather's uncle when he started boxing. And the date on that is actually the 10th of March, 1924. It's actually going to be 98 years old tomorrow pretty cool. It was given to my great grandfather when he started boxing in the Navy. And then when I started boxing, my great grandmother gave it to me. And the whole thing is I didn't know my great grandfather's uncle who boxed. I have a few memories of my great grandfather, not when he was boxing. And this is also just implying the memory of that familial sort of curation throughout more than anything else. And this is really what heirlooms are. They are objects of memory. Uh, heirlooms originate Middle English, first heir, inheritor of property and loam tool. First ones were usually weapons or tools. Heirlooms and inheritance were studied across multiple fields of humanities, including anthropology and sociology, to name a few. They can be considered a subtype of biographical object, but they more explicitly understood history connected with specific families or individuals. And they also accumulate long and known histories being witnesses to events in the past connected to the biographies of their owners. And their presence does imply memory. So this heirloom factor, what is the heirloom factor? Objects, like I've said, have been found to be chronologically older than the context they're in. The first discussion of and what became the heirloom factor was discussed by Baldwin Brown in 1915, excavating early Anglo-Saxon graves. He put it that the low ratio of swords within graves was probably because of inheritance of the survivors keeping the sword. This became known as the heirloom factor, but it has been used for anything that's been chronologically out of place, just kind of casually and never fully investigated, well, until now. So the research aims from this project was to first identify what types of objects were considered heirlooms during the early Anglo-Saxon period, and then analyze and interpret the placement and the mnemonic roles during the funerary rituals. And to understand the social complexity of biographical objects enacted within grave contexts. So what objects would be considered heirlooms? Well, archeological and historical evidence pointed to swords and brooches more than anything else. Both found to be objects of social status, Many have been created using elaborate precious metals and gemstones, and there's a variety of different brooch types indicating distinct identities. And swords were the rarest type of object 
uh, of the weapons assemblage within the wealthiest burials, like Sutton Hoo, as well as Prittlewell Essex, to name two. Examples of certain objects have been found chronologically out of graves, specifically brooches and some parts of swords. The chronology of early Anglo-Saxon graves and grave goods has been constantly updated, though, and still can only really be close to around a 50-year period, whereas continental chronologies are much more conclusive, uh, but not always applicable to early Anglo-Saxon England. In many cases, it's very difficult to identify differences in chronology within one grave text, grave context, sorry. However, there has been some prior research that really uh, assists this and really highlights some inalienable quality of these objects, specifically the process of grave reopening. This is done in 2013 by Ali Klevnis. Uh, she discovered that what was not previously believed to be a, a systematic process in early Anglo-Saxon England was in specific areas of Kent and East Anglia. So basically it was a systematic process of going back to the grave site and reopening them and claiming certain objects. It was a localized tradition, specifically, ooh, thank you very much, uh, specifically in certain areas. Around the Isle of Thanet in uh, northeast Kent is where it usually happened, where in south Kent it didn't happen as much. So it was only happening in certain select cemeteries. However, uh, it usually took place within a decade after burial. Uh, the knowledge of the grave and its location had to be known because they were directly targeting certain graves uh, and specifically only targeting two types of objects brooches and swords, big surprise. Other objects were left in the grave, sometimes very wealthy objects like bracteates, gold bracteates and pendants, gemstones on necklaces, and even raw materials like the iron from uh, spears and shields. Uh, there's even an example of a necklace being moved because of the staining on the collarbones of the skeletal material, necklace being moved that had gemstones on it, two copper alloy brooches taken out, and a necklace left there behind. So something was moved to get to these brooches kind of showing the importance in the selection of these objects. So in certain burials were reopened through large mound constructions. The effort was put in. It wasn't an easy job to get down and get these things. Swords may have been in a very poor state of preservation. After 10 years, you know, I started this going, oh, I want to study swords. Sword in the ground does not look cool coming out. It's a corroded, gross looking piece of iron. And it probably happened to those as well. However, it has been interpreted that the possession of these objects, despite the state, imbued a social status to the ownership within the community. Retrieval signifies and does show the inalienable quality of these objects. So swords in general receive a lot of attention, both scholarly and from the public. Specifically, there's Arnold with his giant famous sword from Conan the Barbarian, fantastic 1982 film. Early medieval swords were symbols of social status. Written evidence specifically records swords as famous heirlooms. It's one reason where we get it from is they're always recorded as heirlooms. They're also personified, uh, given a power and agency within social actions and events. Uh, swords are made of interchangeable parts as well. Pieces of them can be taken off and refitted. And they're almost solely found within the burial record of the early Anglo-Saxon period. Later in the Viking Age, we get a lot of swords and watery deposits in that way. But during this period, only within the burials. A lot of scholarly studies of swords are looking at the typologies, specifically the fittings of the hilt. Uh, the chronologies are trying to get there for sword pieces as well. Uh, creation and forging, they're very famous for some of them have pattern welded blades, as you can see there with wavy patterns made throughout them. Their location in the grave, a lot of swords have shown us that most of them, about 89%, are found on either the left side uh, hip or under the tucked arm, and 11% are on the right side actually that equates to the percentage of handedness in our today's population, so it's actually pretty interesting. In a recent study on the Sutton Hoose sword by Sue Brunning at the British Museum has showed that that one with the abrasion patterns on the hilt was placed on the right and that the person in the Sutton Hoose burial was probably left-handed, so that's kind of cool too. Uh, and also they've been studied for their social roles and importance within early medieval society. Brooches, on the other hand, were dress fasteners. They were pins, they were used to make certain styles, they also displayed ethnicity, identity, and status. They were very simple from basic annular brooches to very elaborate to plated disc brooches with garnets and gold and different materials being used. Kent specifically displays more variety of brooch and dress styles than the rest of Anglo-Saxon England during this period. Uh, and also different dress styles used different brooches and changed over the course of the fifth to seventh century. The bottom there you can see the first two dress styles were the late fifth to early sixth. Uh, we had the peplo style, which is very common across all of early Anglo-Saxon England. We get to the mid-6th century, there's a lot more brooches being utilized. 
sometimes four to six and one time seven brooches being used for one dress style. And then in the seventh century, we get more elaborate singular brooches to nothing when grape goods go out of fashion. But it does travel and kind of change over the course of the early Anglo-Saxon period. Another uh, study that really helps us identify the sort of importance of these objects was abrasion patterns. And of course, again, this goes to Sue Brunning for swords, but asymmetrical abrasion patterns upon sword hilts has shown, rather than looking at the age of the weapon, but also the daily adornment of it. It's being worn every day. The abrasion is specifically on one side. So if the sword is worn at the belt, the belt, someone's hand always resting on that one part of the hilt has worn it away on one side. This has been interpreted to be recognizable because it's there on a daily basis. So everyone in the communicate community would know there's a sword that's connected to this individual and the history of it as well. So the daily adornment within a small community would be recognizable, specifically when they're rarer objects too, creating a known biography for the objects. Heirlooms passed down a couple generations, one or two, adorned daily would have been recognized for an extended period of time, connecting the weapon to more than one individual as well. And this is similar in brooches. There are a lot of repaired and re uh, abraded brooches within these graves as well. We also have things like Frankenstein swords is what they've been called. Swords, like I said, they were made with interchangeable parts where certain pieces were taken off, other pieces were put back on, sometimes older pieces were put back on, newer pieces. This is an example from Coom where that pommel is a newer pommel with art styles put onto an older sword. And if you can look closely where this arrow is pointing is it doesn't actually fit. It's not made for that sword. A new rivet had to be made for it to fit on. So there was effort to put this pommel onto a sword it wasn't actually made for. Another one is the Brighthampton Grave 31. It's been known and actually started this look into curation as the archeological puzzle. It combines pieces from Scandinavia and England stretching from the late fifth throughout the sixth century. So they've been still trying to figure out where the sword is from and who made it and who used it and actual the origins of it. Now going to the historical evidence to look at the history, the minimal history we have of this, it's actually in Kent has the first English law code starting at the very beginning of the seventh century. In 602, 603 AD, we have the law codes of Ethelbert, the first king of Kent. And this includes evidence that property inheritance was already an ongoing practice. So they already had things being inherited. They had that in the statutes and the law codes that were written in there. So that helps. And also shows that the grave was left open for a certain period of time, showing that mourners were coming as well and there was a gathering there. S skipping ahead a few centuries really, but we can look at the early of the later Anglo-Saxon wills. 39 wills that were mostly including the inheritance of land and wealth more than anything else, did include some portable objects. And of course, some of those, there were 11 swords and brooches included in 39 of them. And these objects specifically, compared to the other portable objects, were actually described. Described and actually it was present that they were recognizable. One example was the Etheling Ethelstan had the sword that belonged to King Offa. Of course, who knows if it actually was Offa's sword, the earlier Mercian king, but he named it like that. It was likely recognizable. A brooch example was from Winflade to her, uh, I think it's her granddaughter, Igifu, her old filigree brooch, which is worth sing, uh, six mancuses. It's giving its description as well as its worth as well. And a lot of the other portable objects, though not described, actually reflect what was in the graves of the early Anglo-Saxon period too. So again, it just shows that the brooches and swords were being described and had a, whole, a, a social importance even in the later period. In early medieval literature, Scandinavian and Anglo-Saxon sources name more swords than any other weapon. Early medieval riddles personify swords, like 20 from the uh, 10th century Exeter book, often I kill men with war weapons. The king adorns me with jewels and silver, praises me in the hall. That's been interpreted to be the sword is the answer to that riddle. And specifically in Beowulf, in the Battle of Malden, the old English word laugh used interchangeably for heirloom and sword throughout. Multiple named heirloom swords described throughout the poem. Uh, specifically, even uh, Beowulf's good buddy Wiglaf, his sword received twice as many lines of description than he did himself. So it's kind of showing the importance of these types of swords. And there's a direct appreciation for ancient swords because ancient swords didn't fail. Failed sword means someone died. <laughs> so the older sword that survived means the older sword was worthwhile, it worked. And the final part from the historical would be coming from the fight at Finsburg, which is recounted in Beowulf. Specifically, there's a fight between the Heatherbards and the Danes. Uh, the Danes lost and the Heatherbards claimed the swords of the dead. They had a wedding to try to squashed the sort of blood feud, but then all the young people saw the hilts of their family, the swords of their family at the belts of these heather bards. And of course, there was a murder, people got angry, 
fight came about again, specifically because the visual of the sword being owned by someone else. And this specifically is kind of reflecting that these heirloom swords are almost as genealogies to these families. The ownership they're taking away from them is actually like they're taking away of their history, their story almost. So getting to this now, trying to find heirlooms in search of heirlooms. So this study in early medieval Kent, like I said, fifth to seventh century, analyzed 1,743 burials from 20 cemeteries in Kent. The, cem the cemeteries used had to be modern, modernly excavated. I think the earliest that was used was 1930 because the grave context needs to be able to be interpreted. A lot of cemeteries, specifically some major ones like Sara, were excavated in the antiquarian period, and without the grave context or even knowledge of where the objects were or the skeletal material, it was just not really useful to come to an understanding of what was actually being curated. Uh, Kent was also chosen because it had the highest number of swords deposited within graves, 20% rather than 11 with the rest of early Anglo-Saxon England. It had the most diverse brooch style and dress style utilized, like he's uh, previously talked about. And of course, it did have the first Old English record uh, determining that inheritance was a process here. So the methods used, of course, this was a test to see if this was possible. No one had done this before to try to find these curated objects specifically in graves. So the first step was to look at the chronological disparities of the objects in the graves. Was the typology of spears and shields the same as the swords or were the swords different? Were the brooches the same as other objects as well? What was older? Looking at the chronologies. Then with caution, it looked at abrasion patterns. Which objects were actually worn away or really heavily used? However, this has been cautioned because a lot of times Things can be used. If you, we have an adult that really can't be aged past the age of 45, but there's a heavily abraded brooch, it's not really accessible to say that this may have or may not have been an heirloom. However, abrasion patterns compared to the age of the individual can tell us something. Specifically, if you have a heavily abraded brooch in the burial of a child, it's unlikely that that child wore that brooch for longer than they've existed. So that's kind of can at least help us understand that some of this abrasion can has been done by other people and owned by other people. And finally, finally, it interpreted the visibility within the grave prior to its backfilling, where the object was. Was it visible? Was it covered by anything? So the results of those 1,700 plus graves, 14 were found to be heirlooms. You might be thinking to yourself that that's not a lot. That's actually a very minimal number. What's going on here? There was actually a lot more that did show characteristics, but there just was not enough uh, evidence to determine it as an heirloom. There's a lot of likely heirlooms. However, the small number does tell us a lot of things too, because those 14 were definitely owned by a previously individual. Uh, of the 12 heirloom brooches too, eight were under the age of 18. Eight were sub-adults. And that's kind of interesting to think about too. That was partially because of the methods, but also does tell us a lot about this period and the grave good and actually displaying within the funerals. So the low number of heirlooms identified signifies their inalienable quality while simultaneously displayed their deposition as a rare and important tactic in a funeral procession. Interpretations of why include a differentiation with burial strategy. A lot of these burials, like I said, would do an elaborate display. Some families competing in this very politically uh, competitive society in the sixth century may not have had that wealth or may not have chose to use that wealth. Instead, chosen a biographical route. It could be very important to use a biographical object to impact a funeral rather than just a show of wealth. So it could have been a change of ta tactic. Another one is the connection or extension of biographies. A lot of times connecting the biography of the objects to the deceased can connect a lot of other people and the stories and myths told during the gathering of this funeral. And finally, it could have been substitute biographies. When you have a child buried with an ob uh, a biographical object, it could be the biography to substitute for them because they didn't have the time to make their own at the funeral. And also because these are heirlooms, it's connecting them to the wider family and kin group, which actually is the main point of these funerals when the families are showing and displaying their status and their sort of uh, relationship with the people around the area. So to start with, go over a few case studies. We'll start with the two heirloom swords. Both graves contain heirloom swords that were actually identified through the scabbard mouthpiece. So that's right here. So if you think of the scabbard, which the sword holds, it's a metal mouth band at the top where it went in. Um, no heirloom hilt fittings were identified. This is mostly because as though swords are famous to show their shiny bits like something new and everything, the majority of swords were made with organic materials. A lot of them were uh, keratinous material of antler, horn. So of course that doesn't survive well in the ground. A lot of them could have been curated for quite a couple of generations, but we don't know because they just don't survive. 
uh, both within prominently large cemeteries, two of the largest in Kent, Buckland, which had 431 burials, and Saltwood Tunnel, which had 217. And the first one is a very unique and special and awesome grave. Kind of weird to say, but it is. Uh, it was a late, late 6th to 7th century, but it is an early 7th century burial. It was a male and a female sex skeleton, and both were included with swords. So 96A, the skeleton on the left, was a 40-plus-year-old adult male sex skeleton. 96B was a 20- to 30-year-old uh, female sex skeleton, both with a male-gendered burial, both with swords. And the heirloom sword, as you can see from this uh, very creative grave reconstruction photograph, that gold band I put there, that's the scabbard mouthpiece where it was identified by. That female sex skeleton had the heirloom sword in the possession. The scabbard mouthpiece predates the chronology of the grave. It was a mid-6th century Kempston Mitchum type uh, scabbard mouth. Now, if we have a 20 to 30 year old buried in an early 7th century grave and we have a mid-6th century scabbard mouth, that's a 50 year period generation. And specifically, since swords weren't given to children, it was like almost, pos uh, almost positive that it was owned by, by someone else. Uh, the sword pommel and guards of 96A date to the early 7th century. They have uh, silver fittings, which really you don't see until the 7th century for that style. And the second saltwood tunnel, uh, the second sword grave was that saltwood tunnel. It was, again, very similar to 96B, a male, 20 to 30, early 7th century, which is dated by its grip mounts, which are on the handle. These little uh, Snartanimo Rose style grip mounts on the handle of the sword. And it also had that same scabbard mouth type of the Kempson Mitchum. And only other grave goods within this grave were a Swan F2 style spear. Now, around this area in Saltwood Tunnel, it was the least furnished sword burial, but it had an identifiable heirloom in there. And it kind of showed other sword burials in the cemetery had grave constructions, drinking horns, elaboration, a lot of this stuff, but this only had a sword that was likely older than the individual that was in the grave and a spear. So this specific burial shows more of it was going for the biography aspect rather than the wealth and status in a very competitive, uh, very competitive cemetery landscape. Both heirloom graves are included with individuals on the younger end of those bearded swords, both included around uh, an early mid sixth century scabbard mouth band. Both were also dated to the early seventh century and other sword graves in both cemeteries were found to be wealthier in materials as well. So it's kind of showing a different aspect using the biography of these swords. And also this gets into discussion of scabbards in general. Scabbards haven't really received a lot of attention except for one or two publications really. Uh, but within the entire sample, all the swords were buried within scabbards. There was no swords not within, without, not without a scabbard. Scabbards are identified through their minerally preserved organics, wood, leather, fur, metal fittings, and belt attachments. Scabbards also have been found to be elaborately decorated. They have been through these minerally preserved organics. We see decoration throughout them and also created to match their sword. They're believed to be custom fit to each blade. So it's not like you can take one scabbard and fit it on another without refitting and re-riveting and uh, kind of making some changes to it. Other examples, there are other examples of older scabbard pieces, such as at burial at Blacknell Field, Pusey and Brighthampton as well. And it's understood that hilt fittings were believed to be the recognizable bits, specifically through the studies of abrasion patterns, through the historical evidence, uh, and also pommel specifically. However, the daily adornment of a sword, the scabbard would be visible too, especially when they're elaborately designed. So the inclusion of a scabbard on the sword during a burial would be likely a highly identifiable feature of the biography of that sword specifically. Moving on to the brooches, first one to look at, a female, a young adult, uh, mid to late 6th century burial was a very wealthy burial with a weaving sword, which is actually a status style object. It's actually, it looks like a blade, but it's got marks on it. It was used for measurement, it's been reinterpreted as, for standardizing textile production is the interpretation now. So that kind of shows that, you know, this person is given an object to show I'm in charge here of all the people making textiles in a village, likely. There's other things like a copper mounted wooden box, a casket, a quartz crystal ball in a keystone disc brooch dated to the mid to late 6th century, which dates the grave. It was the trend of that, well, the mid to late 6th century to have these really elaborate keystone disc brooches. But then a late 5th to early 6th century worn and damaged radiant headed brooch, which is from the continent. Now, there's a lot of brooches that show repairs. Brooches could be repaired. They had the technology to do so. And specifically looking at the wealth of this burial, they had the means to do so. But this brooch was kept in its dilapidated state. And this brooch, if you look where it is in the grave, 
is worn centrally around the belt, so it would be basically visible. But it's missing one of its knobs, it's missing garnets, and it's left where its silver gilt is almost totally worn off as well. The difference in the age between the two brooches and the fact that it was kept in such a deteriorated state in a well-furnished grave can only imply the importance of the brooch's biography within this burial. The visual aesthetic of the worn and broken brooch within the assemblage of the young adult and actually uh, contrasting with the elaborate disc brooch with its garnets would be a focal point for the social remembrance of the funeral. Another one similar to that is the first half of the sixth century is at Buckland, grave 20. It is the grave of a six-year-old child or less, and it is adorned as a mature adult, a wealthy, mature adult. Like I said before, children really weren't furnished very much throughout Anglo-Saxon England. This, on the other hand, is put as one of the leaders of the community for someone that really didn't get the age six. It is exceptionally furnished. It's in dress style three mixed with four. It has three brooches, a bracteate necklace, a weaving sword, again, similar to the last one. In the central square-headed brooch has a broken foot plate, uh, mending rivet, so it was tried to be repaired or was repaired at some point, heavily abraded edges, and worn gilding. So obviously this was not the sole possession of this individual and was owned by likely multiple owners. The biography of these previous owners is likely utilized as a substitute for this individual who did not have time to build one. This individual at six years old was portrayed as a mature adult, yet obviously it would be known not to be. But having objects in there such as this may have been a substitute for that and connect this child to the wider familial kin group. And also having a child that died so young would be an emotive uh, time for the family and it might be negotiations between the maternal and paternal families as well. So the biography of the object is to support and enforce the connection between these families of the deceased subadult. Going back to Saltwood, getting into the 7th century, uh, early to mid 7th century, we have a 13 year old now with a very high status burial on a beer and a necklace of gold pendants and precious gems and specifically the class one plated disc brooch that are very famous from this time period, which is dated to the late 6th to mid 7th century AD. On this is extensive wearing of the outer decoration and missing two central garnets. And again, the wearing and abrasion of this style of brooch, which is usually given to an adult, is found at the child's grave, implies that it was owned by another individual. The plated disc brooches indicate elite status. Uh, burial construction is similar to this one in the seventh century and other high status female burials of Swallowcliff Down and Collingborn Duckus. Yet this one is of a 13 year old. The abrasion of brooch exists, it was owned by someone else, and the inclusion within the grave connected the deceased to the elite status of the previous owner and the family in which they belonged. So, of course, the funeral and specifically the brooch were displays of the family status more than anything else. And the final one, which is kind of the outlier of this study, is the only one that didn't come from a big cemetery. Because, of course, these larger cemeteries were known to be platforms of that social negotiations, political competition, because they were where other families came to bury their dead, to mourn, and to get together. However, on the outskirts of the periphery is a small burial plot at Seamark, which is just outside of near Do uh, Dover. It has a uh, class seven, early uh, seventh century brooch, also contained a knife necklace and a few other uh, grave goods, but it isn't in one of the central cemeteries. It potentially represents the move to small plots of elaborate burials, like at Sutton Hoo, the Tranmer House Cemetery, which was used throughout the 7th, 6th century. And then we have the Sutton Hoo Burial Mound starting in really the 7th century. This is kind of the trend that's happening at this period. It may have been a way to show dominance on the outskirts in a certain area. The Avent Class 7 brooch is missing two garnets, was a braided gilding and the rim. The brooch probably older than the child in the companies. And also the inclusion of this Kentish disc brooch is a display of status for the deceased as well as the family within the surrounding area. So those are the case studies. I just want to hit on this because throughout this research, I've always had this question. Well, did they curate Roman objects? And of course, I've already told you a little bit that a lot of them were scavenged. Well, without, throughout the study, I did keep an eye on all the Roman objects that popped up specifically adorned on the body. And there was no evidence of curation of any Roman objects within grave contexts. Out of those 1,743 graves, only two used Roman brooches at uh, Temple Hill. The brooches were centuries old when utilized. One was first century AD, the other one was second to third century AD. Uh, and they, impl they were implemented in dress style one and two, the peplo style, which is kind of be expected. These were likely scavenged. I highly doubt, and even like all through looking through all the heirloom studies that uh, curation of objects over the course of 100 to 200, 300 years is unlikely. It's most likely they were considered antiques, you know, that distant past, they have lost a story and have created their own story for it. 
And there's a lot of evidence of other Roman objects being scavenged. So the one thing is, the, what have the Romans ever done for us? Well, they didn't give the early Anglo-Saxons heirlooms. That's what the study has found. So revisiting the heirloom factor, this study tested a method to identify curated objects included within early medieval burials. It was successful in the 14 graves were identified, which likely more examples were there but lacked sufficient evidence. The small number of heirloom status graves indicated a rare but effective strategy employed by the family to create a memorable funeral for those in attendance. The case studies discussed highlighted different aspects and different interpretations of the inclusion of these heirloom objects. Interpretations of the heirlooms of the subadults, though, subadults generally contain little to no grave furnishings throughout all of early Anglo-Saxon burials. However, these have highlighted the opposite. They are special cases. Previous studies of early medieval burials and grave goods have largely focused upon the connection between objects of the identity of the deceased. A lot of early medieval scholarship recently has looked at this as the identity of the deceased, creating identities, idealizing identities, even trying to change identities. However, these burials suggest more prominent connection between a wider kin group through recognizable biographical objects, heirlooms, objects of memory. So basically, identity of the family may have superseded the identity of the individual. It's something to always kind of keep in mind. The death of a subadult was likely an emotional time for the parents and extended families. This signifies the burial as a social political renegotiation between two, to, to, uh, two families. A child was the physical embodiment of a connection between two separate kin groups. The untimely death of a child likely required a reestablishment of social connection, maybe through the funeral. The use of heirlooms displayed the biography of the wider familial group and rather than the lack of one for the sub adult as well. So like I said, early medieval scholarship has a tendency to focus on identity of the deceased. This study suggests that this may have been a secondary motive of the construction and preparation of burials. Given the socially competitive climate of the six centuries, uh, burials were platforms for families as a whole to pre present themselves. It should be remembered to ask why when interpreting burials rather than just who. So the role of heirlooms during the funeral. Early medieval funerals were believed to have been times of social gathering where identities of the deceased could be displayed, idealized, or even created along with those of the family. The implementation of heirlooms within burials was a rare strategy during a time of social competition. These artifacts would have been worn on a daily basis, publicly seen and known, specifically the older unique brooches and swords, which likely had more than one owner. The artifacts full and long biographies would be remembered and extended to the individuals with which they accompany in the grave, as long as well as the individual stories which were previously involved. However, these objects were also symbols of the families in which the deceased was a part of. The death of a person was also a time where the family would display or negotiate their status to other familial groups gathered at the funeral. Thank you. I've been waiting for this. <laughs> very cool to be right in front of me. Oh, no. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Uh, we'll open up to questions now. Um, so for those of you who are joining us online, um, I'll go ahead and open this up for everyone uh, here to see. Uh, you can either type a question into the chat or you can use the raise hand feature. And I know you've all done that before. All right, um, so uh, any questions we have from either audience? Here? I'm going to ask one bit left, left field, to be fair. This is actually something I didn't include in this, but it did, it did come up. The Stafford Horde, I really have a different, oh, an additional interpretation. I feel that, of course, it's been interpreted as sort of war booty, war treasure has been captured and deposited. But going over to bio, how these were biographical objects, and specifically looking at the time span of the pommels themselves, was there 74 or 84 in total? Uh, a lot of them, and a lot of them were elaborate. The earliest is, I think, a mid, early to mid 6th century Scandinavian pommel that's actually named Dave, I'm pretty sure, too. There's a picture of it in one of my slides. It's got a guy going like this, which I love to use in as many lectures as I can. Uh, I feel that this may have been a way to actually either, one, like the fight at Finsburg, stop another blood feud from happening by taking those heirlooms away and saying they don't exist anymore. So you're not giving them and spreading out the war booty, but keeping them so other nobles and the families of the defeated don't come back looking for them or to annihilate the histories of those families too. Because uh, like I said, a lot of the historical and archeological evidence is showing these pommels, these sword pieces, almost as genealogical. So if you're just getting rid of them, that's almost like destroying a whole family history, you know, wiping it out and sort of resetting that sort of aristocracy in certain parts. 
could be, but I do find that the disposal of such a wealthy material and not giving it out right after a conquest is usually, yeah. yeah. So it's a special case, which was it a way to just kind of kill off any sort of rivalry happening again? It was just uh, an interpretation I'm sort of building now and <coughs> starting to type up when I have the time. <laughs> <coughs> So, so some of those swords mm -hmm. actually could have been long back. This is another part of it, which is interesting, because they are made of interchangeable parts. And one thing I've looked at is there is some evidence in graves of finding sword parts not on swords. Specifically one in Dover, which is between, I think, four, a cluster of four swords about two to three meters apart, is a female gendered burial of an, uh, a mature adult a uh, woman that has a belt assemblage, and one thing on the belt assemblage is a copper alloy pommel uh, cap that's attached to it. And this alone shows, and uh, the other part is that a lot of weaving swords, which I was discussing, some are made from reworked sword blades. So this again would be a biographical approach, which this of course, when the study continues, I would like to look at those specifically as uh, sword parts that are taken away from swords and found in other contexts. Because yes, I feel like even grave reopening, that if you're pulling a decrepit iron cruddy thing out of the ground, but the copper alloy, silver, and gold fittings look really nice, you might just take those off and put them on a new sword. And that might be leading to where Frankenstein swords come from. So, yes. Thanks, Brian. That was really interesting. I guess my question picks up on that and is about the way you use the term inalienable quite a lot throughout the talk. Because if you take inalienable, I don't know exactly how you're defining it, but I would say that means that something can't be separated from the relations in its history and those sorts of things. It can't be cut off from that. Yeah. Um, but actually, it seems to me that one of the things that one of the things you could argue is happening is actually relations are being reworked all of the time. So, like the example there, where you're talking about swords coming to pieces or being put back together, and similarly with your um, substitute biographies, actually you're choosing to kind of put certain relations in the foreground and deny others. Or you can think about your famous swords, where you know this used to be Offa's sword. Okay, well, who else did it belong to in that intervening period? So there's one thing whether the kind of term inalienable, which is a useful shorthand for covering over a bunch of stuff, actually disguises some of the complexity of the way certain kinds of relationships are being made really present at particular moments and others are being denied and how they can be actively reworked, whether materially in taking sorts apart or um, in terms of the histories or in terms of the discourse of the graveside or whatever. I agree. It is a shorthand term to say that, and specifically going out with this articulation, actually grave reopening is, we don't know if it was, we, it was unlikely that it might have been the family who buried it reclaiming that object. It might have been a rival family trying to disgrace a grave. That's also an interpretation. So yes, the interpretations I had with substitute biographies were in interpretations to start this. Like I said, there, there really hasn't been a full study before this. And I, I feel like there's a lot more work to do with it. And also look at the terminology using. Even using the term heirloom itself when you're sacrificing it and putting a genealogy in a way, using it for an instant is an impactful statement, but it's not lasting. So, I've, I've, yeah, looking at the terminology, first of all, and actually other points of view would be necessary to do and actually identify more than just 14 cases of this to do so. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Or actually, could I ask actually what would you uh, call it? Because that was that, <laughs> not my research center. <laughs> hey, I'm doing this. I'm going to be writing this up soon. So I need to <laughs> I just think it's an interesting thing where you tend to, so a word like inalienable brackets mm -hmm. off some of the complexity of what you see, or the potential complexity of what you're being described. The other example is a bit like scavenging. Mm -hmm. It's a similarly kind of, I mean, excavators would be another term you could use, wouldn't it? Uh, which we might not think of as scavenging, but there's a kind of, it just struck me there are loads of like relations and temporalities in your grave and memories that are offering at different scales and times that are operating at different scales. Mm -hmm. And when and certain words come to kind of stand in and tend to cover over those relations. And, and that could be, I just think there's, there's more, I guess I was trying to get at whether there's more ways of opening up those, increasing the, I mean, it's hard because obviously you're limited by the data that you have and mm -hmm. the specificities, but you talked about the way your methodology perhaps partly produced some of the kind of values that you have. Yes. But it's that case of, well, are there other ways of thinking terminologically about how you could how you could open up those relations so that you can I don't know think about them in different kinds of ways I guess so okay. I mean, it's, it just struck me as I was listening to really yeah. fascinating talk about the complexity there might be if you open up if you unpack a term like inalienable and say okay well which bits are inalienable and which bits are actually getting alienated all of the time and forgotten 
you know, the, the forgetting that goes alongside the memory. Yes. You know, to, to remember is to forget. Yeah. So what is it that's not being foregrounded? What's vanishing? What's being cut off from those those um, uh, gatherings that are happening at the graveside or in the aftermath of the grave as much as what's being foregrounded in those moments, I guess. Well, that's good. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, I would like to do this. <laughs> Yes. Is there a possibility that if the family didn't have any heirlooms, they bought a second-hand portrait of the film? Absolutely, maybe. But I think also that you know the stories they were telling that this this could have been highly plausible. Of course, this is an interpretation, but the evidence given that these were familial items is, is likely. Uh, then again, we do find a widespread of trade with, like I said, that radiate-headed brooch coming from the continent. There is a lot of continental objects, a lot of far traveling objects as well. So there's still a lot of variables here. This was first the, the test to see if this was possible and it did highlight a lot of things. Now the possibility and variability of where these things originally came from and what stories would be told about them, that's still up for interpretation and debate. We're just trying to get there. <laughs> yes. So we have a question oh, from Dan. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Um, I, was, I was wondering because you're, um, you say that it's easier to recognize these things in younger uh, individuals. Um, but you suggest that, they, that this is a practice that would have been more common and not just with, within this age group. Do you, and this is, I'm just asking you to guess, how prevalent do you reckon it is? That's actually the next step that I'm looking at, is seeing how many very well furnished subadult burials are out there. Because a lot of it, I mean, some of the ones looking at life cycle and stuff have done general overview, statistical analysis of great goods by age group and specifically bead counts and things like that. Yet there's always these outliers. I would like to keep looking at that, how many very well-furnished sub-adult burials are, have been excavated to kind of get a better idea of the practice and maybe unpack those terms a bit more and find a bit more about that. More about. So I can't really give you a better answer than that right now. <laughs> so when you are talking about the descriptions, of the swords and the brooches. Uh, you said that some of them were described by their price. So that's a very different type of description because that's not a description to make them particular, but that's a description to make them equivalent to the, something different. That's very true too. And that, that there was only four, there was four brooches that were described for, that was included one that described its, uh, its what it looked like, description of what it looked like, was different than other objects that did include the price as well. So the whole thing is it was a trend within these wills to include the price with things, sort of like the clothing and drapery from the house that's worth 15 mancuses, things like that, how much, like, the, 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 how, what the whole worth of the horses were, too. So I think that was more of the structure of that will, but it is a different aspect as well, because like you said, including the price for that does change the interpretation. However, looking at those wills was just a trying to find the, like any sort of historic relevance and seeing that, whereas this is a 300 year difference where a lot of things socially and politically changed, specifically with how graves were run. They weren't run with a furnished burial right anymore. They were run in churchyards more than anything else. So we see this in the wills of saying, praying, uh, praying for the deceased and where the wealth goes. It's almost like what we see instead of putting the wealth in a grave, the wealth is dispersed. However, the descriptions of what the portable objects were in these wills did correlate to the early period grave sort of tableaus, in a way, tableau, yeah. Uh, do you think that some of the presence of heirlooms in sub-adult burials could be because they didn't have any, um, or anybody to pass them on to, or any indications of what they wanted to happen with this when they died? Maybe, <laughs> of, of course. Uh, I feel like looking at other children's burials and everything, I mean, it was a choice to put this in the grave. Because even if they had no one to have inherit this, they could have still carried it and had it put in there, like have someone else put it in their grave too, or go on to someone else as well. So, of course, that was started the heirloom factor really was when swords were in the ground, Baldwin Brown, because they didn't have an heir. And that's why they appeared. That was one of the initial. I just feel it, it's, it, it's likely more, com more, more complex than that. A little bit specifically with the amount and the different types, quality and quantity of objects in these graves. I mean, mostly brooch types for children or annular brooches or very simple, small, long brooches were the most common in these areas. So having an elaborate Kentish square headed brooch that's heavily worn away, broken and has been repaired in the past, uh, it, it seemed like a 
very pertinent and direct choice to do that compared to other graves in the area as well. I mean, looking at the whole funerary landscape of Dover, off Saltwood Tunnel and the rest of the cemeteries, these stood out in a way for how those objects looked even. If I can ask sort of a bit of a follow-up. Um, I, I think I specifically mean in the case of like multi-generational heirlooms, so it's passing down from one family member to the other and all of a sudden this child dies and they don't have a kid to pass that on to. Uh, could that part be part of the reason? It could be. I could say yes. I mean, of course, it's going back and that's kind of that's getting speculation into a family group of, you know, what, what what's happening with them. And of course, yeah, it's totally a possibility. I would say so, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. well, Brian, thank you. I have to ask a question because I'm from these places. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, entrance mic. And this village, Fingleton has the, the sign or an Anglo Saxon brooch, and mm -hmm. people have been robbing that grave mound for years. Um, <laughs> and my first archaeological experience was being in a Buckland cemetery when I was a kid. Oh, jealous. So it was just you know, extraordinary. But like, I want to ask about things like, uh, so, the, so, I, so I want to know about the graves being reopened again. Mm. And you say that it's hard to tell whether it was done, you know, in a uh, with, you know, in an empathic way by people who knew who were buried there, there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera whether this was, you know, scavenging. Yeah. Like, It differs. I mean, it is direct. One thing I can see is it's the direct targeting of certain graves. And of course, there's a the huge project going on now in the grave reopening project across Northwest, Northwest Europe. And I just came out with a paper in antiquity overviewing it in the last year. So it would be good to look at, which I still got to catch up on. But one thing I know is that I've seen some graves with a little bit of care, others where all the, the, the bones, everything was mangled. And actually even where one grave was dug, but they made the grave cut just three inches shy and the sword was missed. So they tried to dig a grave and messed up. So there, there was a little bit of variation from, and of course, this is going from Ali Klebna's work from 2013, more than anything else. But uh, it is, it's interesting. It, it's kind of hard to see. Did they close the grave? I'm not sure. I haven't looked at that in quite a while. I haven't read in a while, but I likely, <laughs> I would say, if not by accident. So I can't give you any more than that, sadly, though. Yeah. I can follow up on the Scandinavian material on that if you want. Huh. Yes, please. Saying, but it was kind of a part of a related complex, and, and uh, a lot of the reopenings are impossible to date. But there was one example where they found a spade, it was a wooden spade, and they could then date it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Really? And so it was actually found out that it was within one generation. I can't exactly remember, but like 35 years or something. Okay, so yeah. Very, very close. Often they target the burial chambers uh, in boat burials, for instance, and there's a sense that they actually know. In some cases, it seems like they target body parts, particularly heads and skulls, and they will go in at the end where, and it's not standardized, and they still know the way the body is oriented. So in some cases, it's very clearly within generational memory, yeah. and they have very specific ideas of what they want to do. Um, but in other cases, we simply don't know, and, and very difficult to date. It could have happened throughout the medieval period and up into modern times that people targeted burial mounds. So likely lots of different things. But yeah, same kind of similar sets of explanations for the Scandinavian material. So some will be about procuring heirlooms and, and objects from the other world. Some will be about retrieving the bones. Some will be about disgracing the burial or a political mm. statement and disgracing the entire kind of monument of power for mm. a specific king. I'm sorry. My voice is failing. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, that does add because we do see a direct, even looking in cemeteries that had this systematic happen. It's like grave goods, but no brooches or swords were disturbed. And then all of a sudden we see a absolutely destroyed grave cut right in and a piece of a sword tang left behind with the sword missing. So there is evidence of that, that they were targeting specifically because they're looking for these objects. That's one thing that is definite. And seeing the staining on collarbones as well, when brooches were taken, but other grave goods were left behind, was obvious too. So, yeah. I didn't find any missing heads, though. That'd be kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask 
Yeah, and as well, like another question actually. That point you made about the material you were looking at being harder to kind of get really accurate um, typological data on in comparison with continental material. Mm -hmm. How much do you think that translates to people's experience? How much that material might seem to people at the time comparatively timeless? Because just seeing there's so much like different temporalities going on in these graves, from the prehistoric burial mass to the Roman stuff to this question about generational knowledge and things. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if that is that just our inability to, you know, would have heard from from the seventh century and then in Kent be able to go, oh no. That's really current. That's a well, half a generation old. That's not, or are they made to be almost timeless, so that there's much more of a sense that these things are deliberately floating around in that in that time zone? Does that make you see? What it does. Yes, it? I think what can help out with this is what actually uh, this entire PhD. What I feel I've become is a sixth century fashion expert, which is really <laughs> the kind of key thing. Uh, specifically, the dress styles. We see a change in a brooch type that go 25 years to, and then they change, and you don't see them again, but they, they'd likely still be around. They didn't just chuck them all away or throw them away. The thing is, in those transitionary periods of like the late sixth century, we'll see elaboration Kentish disc brooches while still using square headed brooches or continental bow brooches, which are kind of where the fashion 10 years ago or was the main where you see in a lot more graves but are starting to fall out of style then so we do see this transition of brooch types and dress styles so i think they did recognize saying it's like there was a fashion style of the time that they did use certain objects and didn't use others and we see this in beads as well and other styles of dress objects too so it does we do see a transition and of course this is only a 150 to 200 year period but we do see a solid transition where there's almost uh, points of transitional periods where we see the use of two types of dress styles and then just one and the disappearance of another. So I feel like there would be an understanding of what is old and what is new and what is current and what is fashionable at the time, really. Though there is evidence of trying to make swords look older, though. There is evidence of making even new swords look old. There was a study done on that. It might have been more Scandinavian continental material, but finding swords is like, that's made to look old, but it's actually not. So it's actually sometimes having old stuff is really cool. We have a question from online as well. How do you think the specific grave locations of high status objects were remembered for later grave reopenings? How do you think they were remembered? I think that is the knowledge, generational knowledge of you know family plots, which is another area of study in this period, which is trying to figure out, finding out we see certain grave plots in some, but it's still kind of hard to interpret. But I think it is just a knowledge of who and what was buried there, which also highlights how memorable these funerals may have been. That things like this were remembered, who was there, what was there too. So I, I feel it is, it was part of there. And of course, this is a localized tradition, so it didn't happen in every cemetery. But the ones that did, it was pretty prominent. We have time to squeeze in one more question. I Brian, are you aware of any studies that have done this outside of Anglo-Saxon England? I know it's weird for me to take the conversation away from Anglo-Saxon England. But... No, I did. There, there was one that was looking at older objects in Finland, I think, and Vestman's done one, but that was looking at more of looking at Iron Age and then actually, I think even Bronze Age material being reclaimed from graves and kept into everything. And I think that was one of the mo most similar. But this was a very small, tight window of a time period. So, but I think that would be a similar one. I have that paper too. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if we, um, if anyone's hiding any questions they still have, we had a really good Q and A today. Um, Brian will be coming to the Market Wellington, so you can ambush him and pose your question to him there. Um, thank you very much um, to all of you who have come, and thank you so much, Brian, for delivering this presentation. If you, you're all welcome to join us the Market Wellington, of course. Um, I want to quickly remind you that we have no presentation next week. Um, this this is a, a new scenario because one of our speakers has a, a different commitment um, that has arisen because of the invasion of Ukraine. Um, so, um, however, on a lighter note, can we please have one last round of applause for Dr. Brian? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Appreciate that. Thank you. Awesome. I can use a beer now.